Hey, Jason Rice here with Lot Party. We have great two next episodes on the Lot Party. I got Ed French, he's a used car consultant. I'm breaking our interview up. It's a 20, 40 minute interview, breaking up the two shows. And we're going over a deep dive into five steps that he thinks that dealerships need to do, what he does to help turn dealerships around to get their used car inventory going. So, this is again two episodes coming up. Here's the first episode. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks. Hey, Jason Rice here with Lot Party. Hey, thank you for joining me. Now, every Monday, again, we do new episodes of a Lot Party. And what we're trying to do, if you've ever been in a dealership, you know what a Lot Party is about. It's to stir that inventory up. You go outside, you get the sales crew, the porters, and you start moving cars around. But that's what this show's about on the virtual world. What can we do online? What can we do with our inventory to stir up some traction, stir up this uh, in, online presence to drive some traffic into the door, and that's what we're doing today. And we're going to be talking to Ed French here now. He's a used car consultant that, uh, with Auto Profit LLC, it's his own company, he's a consultant on used car operations. And we're going to go over, I'm going to have him introduce himself and, and again go over some best practices of what it takes to improve your used car operations. I think anybody that has a strong used car inventory can obviously have a, a strong new car. Uh, uh, inventory and, and new car presence because you don't have to hold back on trades. You can be able to have flexibility stepping up on trades and things like that because you know your used car department can absorb that stuff. So Ed, no further, uh, no further delay here. I want you to introduce yourself. Kind of give us a background of you know where when did you start in the car business, what where you've been, and, and then what you do right now. Now, thank you, Jason. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. Uh, Started in the car business in 1973, believe most everybody uh, in the audience was born. Uh, so I, I can, uh, I think I can take the uh, the the podium as the winner of the oldest guy you've interviewed so far. Oh, there you go. Uh, but uh, it, it's uh, it's been a great uh, 43 years in the car business. Uh, my first car I ever sold was a 73 Gremlin, believe it or not. Ah. So if you know, don't know what it is. That's an AMC. Uh, and for uh, those 43 years, I uh, have sat in every chair in a dealership and uh, uh, for 15 years were, uh, was a managing partner of four operations in the Midwest. We had uh, two Ford dealerships, a Chevrolet, and a Chrysler Dodge Jeep. So uh, uh, during that time, uh, we were retailing out of those operations about 7,000 retail units a year wow. those four operations. So. Uh, we got very busy in the used car business, and uh, frankly, it uh, it was 100% uh, of our success. So we're, uh, uh, I moved on uh, in 2011. My uh, my partner's son succeeded me as the COO of that operation, and I retired, and moved to Florida. Uh, that's where uh, that's where old people go. So, uh, I've now uh, started a consulting business. Uh, specifically, my practice is. Uh, how to improve uh, used car operations uh, for dealers and dealer groups throughout the country. So I work with uh, dealers and dealer groups uh, specifically to uh, improve uh, their digital parity, mm -hmm. meaning what does, uh, what does their virtual presence look like and how does that uh, match with uh, what they're doing presently at their bricks and mortar. Uh, inventory distribution. Uh, what are the what are the attributes for a great uh, distribution of inventory? So it's not just having inventory; it's having the inventory sliced up into uh, different buckets that uh, meet and match the marketplace. And then, uh, what what are the attributes of a great dealership? So, uh, virtually, they have to have a great pricing model, great inventory health, great management rules, and then uh, a great website. So. I focus with dealers uh, across the country in, in these specific areas of practice, Jason. Yeah, and uh, that's what you say, more holistic report, taking a, a view of everything. And I know we talk about like our differences, I own things that I do here, it's more granular because we're, we're grinding through inventory on a daily basis and you're just making sure that this foundation's strong to be able to, uh, you know, to be able to make those adjustments. Because if your foundation isn't strong, like you said, all those attributes there, everything that combine, all those price changes and things you do on a weekly basis really might not matter much, huh? Right, exactly, Jason. It, it, it is foundational by design. Um, I, I think my my best uh, best asset is, is to build that foundation for dealers and then let them customize it to uh, each individual marketplace and frankly to uh, 
the strengths or weaknesses of their human capital. Yeah. So uh, I work with them uh, very closely. The first thing I do, Jason, is I uh, actually go in and do a, a full day review of the actual vitals of the dealership. So we take a look at the numbers. Uh, we take a look at their aggregate cost to sell, their daily boarding costs, uh, many of the same things that you actually expose your uh, clients to. We actually uh, plug those in, take a look at them, and then then take a more uh, detailed look at where they presently stand with inventory and selling processes, and then begin to, to build that uh, inventory distribution and then uh, the dealership attribution model. So, you know, you brought up, you know, customize it. Now, I deal a, a lot on the fundamentals of money management to turn those dollars, you know, good strict 60 day policy I like to get my dealers on and get that turn up to 15, 18 plus. And I think at that point in time, you can kind of have that holy grail of if you push pushing enough fresh inventory out, 60, 70% fresh and less than 5% age, you're going to get gross. And then on a 60 day turn policy, you're going to be able to push that volume. But I think fundamentally, the money management is the same because we get a lot of dealers say, oh, you don't understand my market or you don't understand my clientele, which I get. Every, every you know, a high line store in the city is different than a domestic store in the country in that aspect, but clientele, but the fundamentals of money management doesn't change for one dealer over the other. We just still need to turn this inventory and turn these dollars. So as far as customization on that process, what are some of those tweaks that stores make based off of that you know, kind of setup? Basically what I do with them is I let them decide what kind of return they want to get on the asset. Okay. Um, and and then break that down into the four buckets of inventory distribution. I'm really strong on this particular principle because it will identify the ultimate return on investment of the inventory. So specifically what I do is I actually break down how are you going to distribute your assets? Are okay. you going to distribute them in normal buckets or are you going to distribute them and customize them so as an example we have we break those down into a b c and c cpo buckets okay so an a an a inventory should have a phenomenal return on investment because it's going to be somewhere around 10 percent of the, the asset of the inventory wow. um it's going to be a one-of-a-kind car it's going to have a low market day supply um, it's going to have it's it's that ultimate uh, garage kept non-smoker one owner. Uh, everybody's got a story about that particular A car, and we let them decide how they're going to distribute the asset. Okay, so, so the A car more likely be a trade type of thing. More uh, times than not, car is almost almost 100% a trade. Normally mm -hmm. found on the service drive through either equity mining or some sort of. Uh, a uh, tool to uh, dig a customer out of a car that they wouldn't have thought about normally trading. Okay. Uh, it can be a it can be a really low uh, low market day supply lease return. Okay. Um, but it's a car that we we, we want to get high ROI on, mm -hmm. as opposed to just putting it in the normal inventory bucket. We want to look at it more closely. So we're going to look at it twice a week on VDPs. Uh, we're going to be really slow to make pricing changes, only maybe twice a month. Okay. Uh, we're going to be really critical on its photos and descriptions. Its DNA will determine its return on asset. Okay. Um, so we're really, uh, we really focus on great pictures, great description, great DNA, great call to action. Uh, and uh, focus very strongly on that particular sector of the inventory. All right, now uh, I'm assuming you're a strict 60 day policy guy. Now, would this car be allowed a little bit longer? Or is it still a 60? It, it could run outside the term policy, Jason, depending on its market day supply. Okay. Um, it, 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 I, I have very seldom have they ever run outside the term policy because yeah. these are high demand low market suppliers and it's just not the normal uh, I, I can't remember the last time we had one of these run outside the term policy yeah. normally okay. they don't they don't even get past the the 15 day age bucket and we've made a significant uh, return on asset 
Now, now what percentage of market are you usually trying to start those type of cars out of? Uh, if I'm not starting them at 115 to 120, we're not making enough. Wow. Okay. All right. So, so then what's a B car? A B car is uh, going to be uh, normally your brand uh, could be outside the factory warranty, uh, could be, uh, I, I call them, these are the milk bread and egg cars. <laughs> these are the cars that uh, mid-size four-door sedans, normally your brand, uh, mid-size CUVs and SUVs, normally your brand. Mm -hmm. um, they're going to be the, the ones that you get off. You could go to the auction and buy these. Mostly they're going to be your trades. You'll catch a few of these on the service drive. Um, yeah. They might have some reconditioning risk, but uh, I, normally these are about 60% of the total inventory dollars. Um, some of them could be backfilled in with your rental cars, um, but they're, they're normally going to be that, that Again, milk, bread, and egg uh, fits fits the uh, fits the customers are looking for for a pre-owned vehicle. So, so if you're, we pay. Go ahead. I was gonna say, if it was a Chevy store, would that be a Malibu, or more like a, a Traverse or Yukon or something that might be a little bit more? Yeah, Malibu, Traverse, uh, Equinox uh, could be Cruise, depending upon the marketplace. Yes, okay. that would be All correct. Right. Yeah. All right. All right. And then, um, paying special attention to the equipment color if they're over an eighteen thousand dollar ask price. Okay, is that a ninety eight to hundred percent of market type car? Or are you still at or a little above? Or Starting what? those at ninety seven to ninety nine from uh, the beginning and really watching VDP activity closely. Mm -hmm. Um, these cars we're focusing again on total gross, not uh, front end and back end. We're looking at the total. Uh, the only takeaway I can give you from this one, Jason, is is I really evangelize to the dealer. Do not fall in love with these cars. Yeah. They're on every car. All right. So, so this was, I mean, if you focus on front end, are you are you still allowing them to mark it up fifteen hundred or two grand, or are you saying no? It's 97, 90 percent regardless of how you own it. Does that's the other part. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's, that's the thing when you said, you know, it's all front and gross driven. I don't want anybody to be confused with him saying, you know, still try to make your 1500 or two grand on it. No, it's 97, 99% regardless if you're losing 200 or you're making two grand, right? Right. Okay. Correct. Yeah. Where, where we really focus this particular segment of the uh, inventory on using your pricing and marketing tools effectively. Okay. Um, this is where they really come into play. Um, because specifically color and optionality here make these things in VDP activity. And frankly, a, the description of this car becomes critical. This yeah. is one where you can't really use Auto Rider. Mm -hmm. Really got to specifically spell out the condition of this car and spell out its optionality. Mm -hmm. Meta tagging here is huge, and yeah. flat pricing here is huge. Yeah. So. Um, those are both those are both have to have tools in the toolbox for the B inventory. Now, uh, for people to know what MetaTag is, uh, what it, you know, an explanation of that is kind of like MetaTag your website. Basically, put every type of uh, feature benefit in the comments and description and multiples of. So if it's a sunroof slash mooner, if it's a navigation slash nav slash GPS, you want no matter how somebody's looking for a Malibu with GPS. Well, if you have it in there as a Malibu with uh, navigation, you might not show up. So these cars, you got to maximize uh, your content on your descriptions to maximize that exposure. Uh, so we've got 70% of the inventory covered and A, a and B, so what's a C then? The C car that a lot of dealers uh, up until just a, a very few months ago, they were wholesaling. So a C car in my mind is a car that's out of warranty um, it's a car that would compete against the independent dealer's inventory. It could be um, uh, five years old and older. Uh, potentially, it could have over 100,000 miles on it, mm -hmm. uh, depending upon what state you're in and what your state inspection laws uh, yeah. would allow you to sell. Um, this is a car that, so specifically, you might have nine or $10,000 in it. 
but potentially you can get an extraordinary return on investment and return on this car. Cars that we don't recondition all the way. Uh, I encourage yours to have less. This is a C car, so a C car may only have uh, 40% of the brake life left, may only have 35% of the tire tread left. Uh, all the options were the air is cold, it's safe, uh, may have a few scratches in it. We may not have spent all the money on PDR. Uh, it's been detailed, uh, but it's uh, it's a car that would compete in the marketplace against uh, independence. Okay. It's going to run about 20% of the inventory. All right, so that's 90. What's the last one left? All right. What's that last? That's 90% of the inventory. What's that last 10%? Well, I, you know, the CPO business is uh, I, for dealers that uh, aren't uh, getting a tremendous amount of pressure from their OEM, uh, CPO is 10% of the business. And I know that there are movements of the foot to, to move that needle. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't necessarily always give us the highest return on asset. Yeah. So when I go into a dealership, I, I want them to maximize the opportunity it up with what kind of return on investment do they want to get from their inventory? ROI on inventory, a lot of dealers don't measure it, Jason. They, yeah. they don't really look at, at it. I, I encourage dealers to look at it strongly. Yeah. So I, I you know, the, the measurement of ROI for me as a benchmark is 35 to 40% return on inventory from a net profit as a percent of uh, net profit divided by the monthly in inventory uh, gives you a really quick snapshot of uh, where you are on the uh, ROI. Now, to a little bit of a defense of the CPO, because I know the stats, that's growing and it's getting bigger. I was just at the, uh, and, you, and I believe you were there too, Auto Remarketing's um, and the CPO, and some of the stats about, you know, and I questioned some of them because, and they had to answer that was, you know, they, they had a stat that two, uh, a high percentage, like 60% of customers would be willing to pay two grand more for a certified, and I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. They'd be willing to pay or they actually do pay because we don't see those type of stats that they actually do pay. And, that, and again, that could be the fault of the manufacturer ourselves explaining the benefits, but they don't pay that type of premium unless you're maybe a Lexus BMW type dealer. Um, so to defend the, the, the CPO a bit, though, even if I am a Chrysler store and I, and I break even, I'm, I'm barely making any money on these certifieds, the, the total RRI for the store you, tends to be up, though. They did have a pretty strong stat that you still get a high penetration. Matter of fact, the number one Chrysler certified dealer said his F&I is actually higher uh, on certified than the average. And also, you know, the, the retention rate and stuff of service and things like that, and the upsell from having the CPO for a while to the next steps of the new car. So would you say, though, I mean, to defend CPO a bit, that it, overall ROI could be beneficial for the dealer? The overall ROI on a CPO, Jason, is terrific. Yeah. The, the the question becomes, does it fit with the strategy that a dealer yeah. wants to, to make? So if yeah. you're going to move that CPO needle, you've got to take it basically from the B bucket, and that can ultimately affect turn. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're going to be in the CPO business, you have to pay special attention to what is the effect on turn, which ultimately will affect ROI. Sure. So Especially the Highline stores, because they run into parts holds and getting these cars and paying stupid high money for them. I got an Affinity store that just, by the time they buy it, transport it, certify it, I mean, there's hardly any meat on the bones. But it's something that they have to do for allocations and things like that. So. Hey, Jason Rice, check this out. We got the Lot Party Cruise newsletter now if you go to lotpop.com we have the place up at the top to sign up for the newsletter which will give you links to the newest show the previous show our newest tip our, our party files where we talk about the bad photos and descriptions that people have done we also have tommy gibbs uh zinger tips in there so we have some great content sign up for our newsletter go to lotpop.com you can also see our twitter link there facebook linkedin uh google plus we're on iTunes also, so check out iTunes, look for Lot Party. Uh, you can just listen to the episodes there, or if you happen to be a Droid user, it's also on SoundCloud. You can get the SoundCloud app, and everything that we put out there is 
uh, on a podcast too to just listen to. So again, hit lotpop.com. You can go join our lot party crew at the top, get the newsletter, and have all this content coming to you every week. Every Tuesday after the show Monday, if you missed it, don't worry about it. With the newsletter Tuesday, we'll send a link to the latest show and all the current information and greatest newest tips. Thanks.